At this point, I'm a pretty decent woodworker. I'm also a good husband and an okay dad, but I am a great son. Let me explain. All right, here's the deal. My parents just left for vacation and I want to surprise them when they get back with a brand new dining table. So we're on our way to GL Veneer right now to pick out a nice slab. Now don't get me wrong, I've built them a ton of stuff in the past, but if I'm being honest, I would say that their house right now kind of consists of experimental pieces from early on in my career and stuff from Ikea. So I want to make them something that they can be really proud of and that I can have back when they die. Just joking about that last part. I've already got a ton of furniture, so I don't know. My brother can have it. All right, let's just cut to the lumber yard. Okay, so they got a lot of interesting stuff at GL, but we're not here for a giant wizard head. We want a slab. So this gentleman here is Dan, and I told him I wanted to try something new, and he suggested a wood called monkey pod. And I figured, I love monkeys, and I love AirPods, so yeah, let's do it. So we picked out a slab from their online inventory, found it in real life, and then since it's way thicker than I needed it to be, we took it over to this crazy slab flattening machine that they have where you load up your piece and it kind of spits it back and forth, making it thinner with every pass. Then, when you've had enough on one side, it goes into this giant Pac-Man looking thing that eats your slab like a dot, flips it over, and spits it back out to get the other side. It's crazy, but I love it. Anyway, then Dan got me all loaded up in my very real truck, and it was back to the shop. Okay, here is my number one tip for anybody who wants to work with slabs. Well, probably not actually my number one tip, but a tip that you probably haven't heard anywhere else. Let's say that. And that is, find the broken ones whenever possible. First, there's a chance that you could get a discount on them. Second, I think a lot of times they look cooler when everything's said and done. And third, and most important, it's way easier moving around two kind of big chunks of a slab versus moving around one gigantic chunk of a slab. And trust me, throughout the course of a project, you will end up flipping it, moving it, and picking it up dozens of times. Now, if you're wondering how to go about finding the broken ones, look for straps. Or if you don't have crippling social anxiety, you could probably just ask somebody. So I went back and forth with whether I was gonna talk about what happened next in this video or not. But as you can see here, I've got the slab up on the CNC to flatten and thin them a bit more. And you might also notice that my dust collection isn't working too well. It's kind of hard to see on camera, but I was getting a lot more airborne dust than normal. Now I actually have a couple new dust collectors on the way, but there wasn't really anything I could do about it right in this moment, so I figured I'd just keep going. So I'm literally on my last pass of the last half of the last slab, sitting in my office here. The CNC's over here, by the way. And I look out the window and notice a lot of dust. So I get up, walk out the door into the shop, and I kid you not, there was a literal flame shooting out of the dust collector. So I run over to the CNC, hit the emergency stop, run over to the dust collector, look over at my fire extinguisher, make the split second calculation that there is no time. So I just rip out the plug in the hoses, start running it all the way across the shop. About here, the bag basically turns into a fireball. I throw it out the door and onto some dirt, and it could have been really bad. Now, I don't know why or how this happened. All I do know is I will never run a cut like this without being present. And all joking aside, I am very grateful that other than a little stench, everything is fine and good. Now, thankfully, I called up my friends over at Street Tree Revival and told them about what happened. And Danny, who could definitely win a Jon Snow lookalike contest, was able to get the cut finished on their Woodwiz in like three minutes. All right, so after that minor setback, I've got the slabs back in the shop here and I'm picking a layout. So design-wise on this one, the biggest obstacle is going to be the fact that half of the seating for my parents' dining table is a banquette. So there needs to be room for people to be able to slither into place from here and here. In other words, no legs on the perimeter. Also, my mom hates sharp stuff, which, if you know my normal style, makes me think I might be adopted. So I know my mom's gonna want big radiuses on all of the corners. And my dad, meanwhile, 
has become the sharp corner police ever since Dolores and I had kids. So basically, if I do put a sharp corner on this table, my mom's going to hate it and my dad's going to put a pool noodle on it. So I'm just going to try to avoid that. Other than that, though, all I'm really thinking about at this point is 84 by 40. Or if you're not in the U.S., 214 by 102. That's what size is going to fit their space. By the way, anytime I mention anything having to do with imperial dimensions, I get comments telling me about the superiority of the metric system. So I'm going to conduct a little poll here. If you prefer the metric system, give this video a thumbs up. And if you prefer the imperial system, give this video a like. And then I'll tally up the votes in a couple weeks and we'll see where we land. Also, if you think that's not a very scientific poll, go ahead and hit the subscribe button to show me that. And we'll consider that the sort of peer review process. Here I'm giving you a video definition of the idiom penny wise and pound foolish by reusing a $40 sheet of melamine to make a tabletop that combines a slab worth thousands of dollars and epoxy costing hundreds. Probably not the smartest move. And as much as I'd like to tell you that the reason that I do this is to be economical and environmentally friendly, the truth is I'm always just too lazy to go get a new sheet. So I pretty much wait until it's hanging on by a thread. But the result's the same, right? Saving the world one piece of melamine at a time. And whether that's due to virtue or laziness, doesn't really matter. And actually, while I'm on the topic of idioms, one that's always made my head spin is dimes to donuts. You know that one. Like right now, you're probably thinking, I'll bet you dimes to donuts Chris is about to go off on a tangent. Well, you're right. So here's the thing. I get what it means. But in the time since it was coined, and now, we've gone from a world where you could probably buy several donuts for a dime, to a world where you would need several dimes to buy one donut. Basically, it's flipped. So that always makes me think that in like 1953, there must have been this point of intersection where donuts actually did cost a dime, and then that phrase made no sense. These are the kind of thoughts that keep me up at night. That and worrying about epoxy spills, which, despite my throwing caution to the wind with this form, I had none of. Held tight like a champ. A minute ago, you might have noticed me using a big brass mechanical pencil. And if you've seen any of my recent videos, then you know that that's the pencil that I've been designing for the last few months. And don't worry if you didn't notice, because you will see more of it later in the video. That said, last month we finally released it, and... It immediately sold out. Then about a week ago, they started shipping and I started getting comments from people and I could not be happier with the response so far. Here's a few emails I got. And for people like Vic's friend, I'm putting together another limited run. So if you missed out the first time, seriously do move fast. I promise this is not a sales tactic. They really do go fast. And if you don't care about any of this stuff, then let's just move on. So at this point, you can see that the slab is coming out of the form pretty easily. And believe it or not, when I get to this point in a build, my confidence is usually pretty sky high. And that's because I know that the hardest part for me is in the rear view mirror, the epoxy. So here I'm actually feeling pretty good about myself. I'm flipping the slab and cleaning up silicone from the underside, flipping it back over, not a care in the world taking it over to the CNC so that I can flatten it again. I've got my new dust collector hooked up, which works great, by the way. Doesn't even catch on fire, which is awesome. First side comes out great, so I flip it over. And then, let me just tell you about it in real time. Okay, um, ran into a pretty big problem. I've never had this happen before, but basically flattening the slab and noticed like a big wet spot some epoxy soup, which is not good. Pretty sure I know what happened. Earlier in the video, I talked about being penny wise and pound foolish and I did it again. So I used expired epoxy, which I thought was gonna be fine. I mixed it all up, everything looked fine, but I did find these few little bits of almost like crystallized epoxy in there. I assumed that as the epoxy heated up, that stuff would just kind of melt in. Uh, apparently it didn't. In hindsight, what I should have done is one, not used expired epoxy. And two, if I was going to use expired epoxy, I should have strained out the bad stuff that I saw in there. It was just a couple little ones. What that means is 
probably in there, there's gonna be more of that stuff floating around. But as long as it's not on the surface, I think it's gonna be fine. I don't think I would feel comfortable selling something like this to a client. It's for my parents, so it's fine. It'll be a good test to see how it holds up over the years. I'll have access to it. The good news is the wet spot seems to be only about as thick as those little flakes were, so not even a 16th of an inch thick, probably a 32nd uh, in metric. That's some very small amount of millimeters. But yeah, I think it's gonna be fine. Um, this is the underside of the table, so that's good. I already did the top and it was fine. So I'm gonna finish cleaning all this up and then I'll get back to it and yeah, learn from my mistake, I guess. I film a lot for these videos, arguably too much. I mean, just right here, what do I have like 10 shots of me setting up a track saw and then making two cuts? Yet somehow every video, I still miss good stuff. We're only 11 minutes into this video and as you already know, I've missed a fire and whatever my reaction was to finding uncured epoxy in the slab. So I decided that I need at least one camera that's monitoring me 24 seven. And I also decided that if one was good, three would be better. Now, in fairness, two of them are gonna be monitoring the outside, but I'm gonna hook up one of them inside. Not that I hope or plan to have any more shenanigans, but if I do, hopefully I'll catch it. And I'm guessing that by now you've caught on to the fact that I'd like to thank Real Link for sponsoring this video. So what I have here is the Real Link Argus PT Ultra, which is a 4K battery powered security camera that's packed with features like the ability to pan and tilt and a spotlight. And it's just one of four 4K battery powered security cameras that Real Link offers. So like I said, two of these cameras I'm actually gonna set up outside. And what's really cool is that I don't need to run any wires through walls or anything like that. And I can even run it nonstop using these solar panels. And if you live where weather might be a little bit more harsh, don't worry because they're built to withstand rain and snow. Now I definitely could have placed these cameras in a more discreet spot if I wanted, but to be honest, I want mine to stick out. For my money, the best thing that these things can ever do is tell a would-be burglar, not here pal, better look elsewhere. And I feel confident that if someone does show up, these cameras will be ready, thanks to handy features like human vehicle and animal detection, dual band Wi-Fi compatibility, and if it comes down to it, and I do need the footage for any reason, they can record to an internal micro SD card or to a hard disk that I keep inside. So if you like tech and could use a more secure home or workspace, check them out using the link in the description. And thank you again, Rio Link, for the cameras and for sponsoring this video. All right, so as you just saw there, for my mom and dad's security, we put a nice radius on all four corners of the top. And now here I'm touching up some of the more major problem areas on the top, as well as some of the super major problem areas. And these are gonna need a few days to set up. So you guys might remember in the last video I mentioned how lately I've been going online to get my wood, which I hear a lot of married men still do. Sorry, I guess my lumber rather, from a place called Woodworker Source. And anyway, in that video, I made a little joke about how the only thing I miss about going to the lumber yard was being called hun by the elderly ladies who work in the office. Well, apparently whoever packed up my last order from Woodworker Source heard that because they sent this in the package. Thanks guys. Okay, let's talk about the design of this one. So this isn't actually the first table that I built for my parents. Many, many years ago on this channel, in fact, I built them a dining table out of plywood which if I'm being honest, wasn't really their style. I was just kind of going through a stacked plywood phase as kids often do. Functionally though, this table's worked out really well for their house, except the whole sharp corners thing. So my first thought was to just translate that design into a hardwood version with softened edges. The problem with this design though, is that all of the support is coming from these two centered vertical pieces. So over time, if people push on the table to help them stand up, it's gonna really stress and loosen these joints eventually. So next I played with a design that fixed that, which I think is nice, just not really my style. And then there was another one that I thought was cool, but would kind of become an obstacle for people trying to slide into the center on the banquette side. So what I ended up coming up with is sort of a marriage between these two. And you can definitely see the shared DNA with the original. I'd say this one is maybe like a second cousin thrice removed, which, I don't even know what that means, so I don't know why I said that. 
but you get it. It takes inspiration from the original, but is new in every way. Kind of like the new Beetle, or the new Challenger, or the new Camaro, or the new Mustang, or the new Bronco, or the Mini Cooper, or every 911 ever made, or every Jeep ever made. Or... Sorry, I kind of drifted off there. Where were we? Oh yeah. So here I'm working on the sort of, I don't know, double cross looking pieces. This one's gonna go on the ground and this one's gonna go on the underside of the top. And as you can see, this one is bigger than this one. But where the wings go on both have to line up. So basically here I'm taking my short piece and long piece, finding their centers, lining those up, and then measuring out an equal distance so that that'll happen. Easy. Then from there, I need to make all of the wing pieces. So here I'm just cutting out a bunch of oversized chunks. And then I'll just mark the center on each one. And if I line up my new marks with my old marks, it'll all work out. Again. Easy. And I think this is a really good takeaway. And that is, a lot of times the parts of a finished piece that look complicated are actually pretty simple. And on the opposite side of the spectrum, the parts that look simple can sometimes be pretty difficult. I think to most people, if you were to look at this piece, they would probably think that making these two cross shapes is the hardest part of this build, but it wasn't. What you just saw me do was the most technical part of these shapes, and it was pretty simple. Find the center, mark out 20 and a half inches on both sides, and you're good to go. Then once you've done that from that point forward, the rest of the shape, all the curves, it's all just aesthetics. There's nothing functional about it. And if you're a little off here or there, no one's ever going to notice. And there's actually an easy way to make the shapes look good by using templates. And I'm not going to say that making templates is easy, but it is low risk. You just draw things out until it feels right, and you can do it as many times as you want. And then whenever you're ready, you cut them out and shape them. And once you're happy with your templates, you're basically just tracing the shapes onto the actual pieces. And I know it might look confusing if this is your first time seeing it, but it's actually a super repeatable step-by-step -step process and it doesn't require any high level of hand-eye coordination or anything like that. It's just a bunch of simple steps that happen to add up to something that looks complex. And really, that's what most woodworking is. There's very few things that require a ton of artistry. Maybe like carving a claw and ball foot or something like that. But that stuff would look dumb on my furniture anyhow. I guess... This is all my way of saying, if you want to follow some step-by-step -step instructions to build something great and take the guesswork out of it, go check out our plans. There's a link in the description. Now, as I said a minute ago, sometimes the stuff that looks hard is actually simple. And now here's a good case of the opposite, where the stuff that looks simple is actually hard. So what I'm doing here is making all of these vertical pieces that'll connect my two double cross things. And actually making them is simple. I'm just making six pieces that are all the same length and have the same 10 degree angle cut on their ends. The hard part is accurately positioning everything when you go to attach it all. So first I'm gonna be using dominoes to do this and I want this joint to be really strong. So I'm gonna really load it up, which is not really hard, I guess, but you just need to make sure that you're really paying attention because each piece is slightly different. And I don't wanna brag, but I did a really good job of paying attention to everything here. So the real reason this is hard is because even if you're like me and you painstakingly model everything in 3D, you still can't tell where everything is gonna need to go. I mean, you can in theory, but the chances of what's theoretical and what's real being the same is not likely. So if you do just blindly follow what's supposed to be, you're going to end up with problems. So my solution for this was to only cut the joinery in the bottom half and then just set the top piece in position and mark out where things actually hit and not where they were supposed to hit. And then by just kind of working backwards, I can mark out where I need to cut in everything.
Just when you think you got everything figured out, something dumb happens, so I'm gonna vent while I put these clamps away. So the base is made out of maple, which is pretty hard. So I was pre-drilling because maple's so hard. And I thought I pre-drilled everything, but apparently I missed two of them because two of the screws stripped, and now I have everything together and I cannot get these two apart. So I'm kind of brainstorming what I'm gonna do. I think I'm going to first try to get the screw out, but I know there's gonna be part of it that's gonna be stuck in there. So I'm probably gonna just have to like, I don't know, cut it out or something, maybe multi-tool. And if I can get that, then everything else should be fine. <laughs> it's gonna definitely mess the piece up, but hopefully I can keep it to where all the problem areas are just under where the joint is so that you can't actually see it. We'll see how it goes. You'll know before I do. So the reason I'm taking things apart here is Right now the piece would look like this, which is nice, but a little clunky. And I want it to look like this. So basically I'm taking it all apart to do all of the shaping, which would pretty much be impossible to do if the piece were already assembled. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna try to predict the future. So I try to be pretty active in the comment section, responding to people's questions, but I'm gonna try to preemptively answer a question that I think I'm gonna get a ton of with this one, which is, why use screws in the first place? So you just saw that they caused a lot of problems. And if I'm being honest, they really aren't providing much strength here. So the reason is they're like little mini clamps. You'll notice that when I'm putting this thing together, I didn't use any clamps. And the reason for that is I was worried that I wouldn't get good even pressure and that I might even bend the wood and then create little gaps where the pieces meet. So that's the reason. And if you were wondering that or even commented on it before I got to this point in the video to explain myself, then I've successfully predicted the future and here are tonight's lotto numbers. Now let's talk about everybody's favorite topic or at least the topic I get asked about the most. How much does a table like this cost? So here are the numbers. The most expensive material input on a wooden table like this is gonna be, and I hope you're sitting down for this, the wood. So this slab plus all of the wood for the base cost about $5,000. Then you've got your epoxy and this table used quite a bit. So that's about another $500. And then we'll call all the other stuff. So that's the hardware, the finish, yada, 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 another hundred bucks. So we're at about $5,600 in materials. Then there's the most expensive part, the labor. And this is always tricky to calculate. So this time to calculate that, I'm just gonna ask ChatGPT how much does a fine furniture maker charge for their labor? And they said 30 to $150 per hour. So let's just land right in the middle at 90. And I'd estimate the build time on a table like this is about 60 hours. So that's $5,400 in labor for a grand total of 11,000. So I guess there's three ways that you can look at it. One, a table like this costs $11,000. Two, I missed out on the opportunity to profit about $5,400 if I would have taken the time I spent on this project and built something for a customer instead, or three, I lost $5,600 in material costs on this build. None of those are really great options, but the first one feels like less of an attack on me personally. So I'll think of it that way. All right. Um, I didn't want to do this, but I said something earlier in the video that I probably shouldn't have, and I think I owe somebody an apology. So to refresh your memory. The past, but if I'm being honest, I would say that their house right now kind of consists of stuff from Ikea. So I want to make them something that they can be really proud of and that I can have back when they die. So if anybody out there from Ikea is listening, I shouldn't have said that. I think it might've come across like I was saying that having furniture from Ikea in your house is a bad thing. And it's not. I have stuff from Ikea and I'm a furniture maker. Honestly, truthfully, I'm switching back to being sincere here. It would be a dream come true to get to design something that Ikea would sell someday. And I guess I don't mean Ikea specifically. I just mean to be able to make something that millions of people could potentially have in their home. That would be awesome. Okay, I just wanted to get that off my chest. 
Okay, so here's the plan. I had wanted to get this built before my parents got back from vacation, but they came back a week ago and I literally just put a coat of finish on this yesterday. So obviously didn't make it, but it's still going to be a surprise. They don't know that I built it. So I'm going to call them right now and have them come help me move something, which they might be suspicious of. I don't know why they would think I would call a couple of elderly people to help me lug heavy stuff around. But whatever, they're full of themselves, so let's take advantage of that. Here's how I imagine it's going to go. They're going to get here. I'll have the piece covered up. They're going to say, where are we moving this to? And I'll say, I'm thinking your house. And then we'll just see where it goes from there. Can't really plan it out too much. I just got to see what happens. So that's the plan. Okay, real quick before we reveal the table to my parents, I'm just going to quickly say thank you for watching this video. I truly do appreciate it. And if you've enjoyed it, consider giving the video a like and subscribing. All right, let's see what my parents think of the table. Where are we going? I was thinking we'd take it to their house. My house? Yeah. It is? Oh, just it's like, beautiful. Oh my God. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I love it. Thank you. Now I feel like everything else in my house is ugly. I built all that stuff. <laughs> You're filming, really? Yeah. To get our reaction? Yeah. I would have worn lipstick and fixed my it's hair. It's a far away shot. And I want to have a ZZ top here. <laughs> See you in the next one.